<laughs> okay, good. Uh, so a little bit of sensual pleasure is okay, right? <laughs> okay, excellent. So I hope you are ready for some more. This is very intensive. Yeah, uh, one hour after the other one is like uh, I don't know. It's <laughs> super intensive. So I hope you're okay with that. So we're just going to carry on going from sensual pleasures to the reality of the Dharma, going from sensual pleasure to old age. Yeah, this is kind of the the movement here. Yeah. So um, we've just been looking at old age uh, being part of the first noble truth. Uh, yeah, part of right view of what is dukkha. And uh, you may wonder, again, why, what, exactly how is this right view? Obviously there is old age, obviously it is problematic. We need to reflect on how problematic it is, uh, and why it is suffering, and all of these kind of things. And sometimes, as I mentioned, it's good to ask people who are already older than us, yeah? Um, and uh, then to find out why it is so difficult. Uh, so what is the point of this? What does it do to us if we do this in the right way? Uh? And there's at least two things that it does, and the Buddha mentions these things in the suttas. Uh, and one of the things that he says that it does, it takes away some of the intoxication of the mind. Uh, yeah, often we get intoxicated with life. The Buddha says specifically we get intoxicated by the idea of being young. Yeah, I'm youthful. Yay, not me, but you know, just generally. <laughs> You're young. Yeah and full of energy, you can do many things, and you get intoxicated by that. And because you are intoxicated by that, uh, you do silly and stupid things in the world. Uh, you think that you have the right to exert your youthful energy. You forget that it is impermanent. You forget that the other side of the coin of youth is old age. Uh, yeah, if, you got, if you're young, you're also going to be old. Uh, and also the opposite, if you're old, you're probably going to get young again. Uh, yeah, so these things go in like in cycles, round and round and round and round, and they all belong together. They're not separate issues. Uh, the word youth only exists because of old age. Uh, yeah, these are words that only have a meaning uh, insofar as they have the opposite and the contrast. Uh, so it actually makes you a much better person. And that's why the younger you are, the earlier you remember the reality of life, the easier it is for you to live well, to live with wisdom, to live with a good heart, because you understand that this youthful energy needs to be expended in a good way, not on frivolous things, uh, not on being stupid, uh, not on pursuing empty things in this world, but from the very beginning to remember what actually matters. Uh. So the Buddha says specifically that if we reflect on old age, uh, we give up the intoxication of youth. Uh, yeah? And when you give up the intoxication of youth, you don't do bad actions by body, speech and mind. Instead, you do good actions by body, speech and mind. Uh. So it's kind of simple, yeah? It's simple how this right view works. Uh, but it, now you can start to see why it is profound. Uh. You ask a young, very young person, yeah, teenager, you know you're going to get old one day, and they say, yeah, yeah, whatever, and they're not really going to listen to you, yeah? If teenagers are too young to really understand these things, uh, or m maybe not always, some teenagers are very sharp, but sometimes they are, uh, yeah, but if they get this, uh, and this is why it's so profound, they have to actually think about these things, and then when it starts to really sink in, whoa, okay, good point, uh, yeah, okay, I better do something about this. Uh. So this is the first point. Uh, Always, uh, it helps you to steer your life in the good direction in the right way. Yeah. But the other thing that it does when we remember old age and these other negative things, I'm going to come to more negative things afterwards. Uh, I'm going to be very negative today. Uh, can I? Uh, would you allow me to be negative today? It's going to be <laughs> one kind of negative thing after the other. Yeah. And the other thing is that it takes away some of that. You realize life is actually not as glorious or as wonderful as you think it is. Uh, because we don't really usually think about old age, we don't usually think about illness and these things. Uh, it takes away some of the things that we think that life, sometimes people think life is so wonderful, life affirmative kind of religions, uh, everything is so great. Uh, and when you take away some of the glory of life, some of the wonder of life, seeing it as something special and amazing, uh, what happens is that you turn your mind in a different direction towards other things. Uh, 
if the ordinary life is not so interesting, well, what is interesting here? And of course, what is interesting is that you turn your mind away from the physical realm, the senses, all the things in the world, towards the mind instead. Because the mind is a place where you can always develop, where you can always find happiness regardless of what happens in the physical realm. Your body can be really down, it can be really out, and yet your mind can still be happy. Like the Buddha says to Nakula Pita in that famous sutta in the Kanda Sangyutta, Kanda Sangyutta, the twenty-second Sangyutta, the first sutta is it not? Is it the first one? I think m- maybe the first sutta. I can't remember now. Where Nakula Pita, Nakula Mata, they go to the Vendabhasari Putta and they ask him, "Oh, we are getting old or whatever." No, and maybe it's not the first sutta. It's one of those suttas anyway. Nakulapada goes to the Buddha and says, well, I'm sick, what should I do? And the Buddha says, well, or Sariputta says, well, even if you're sick in the body, you can be healthy in the mind. Yeah, mind and body are separate entities. They can be kept apart from each other. Very often we feel them together, but in the kind of the, if you really meditate well and live in the right way, you can separate yourself away from that body. Uh, the mental development can still happen. We can find a refuge in the mind. Uh, and so much of Buddhist practice uh, of developing the mind is finding that inner refuge inside, uh, which is it c- takes you away from the external world, uh, give you a sense of independence, uh, of contentment, uh, of freedom from so much of the suffering of the world. Uh. So when you think about the, the limits of life, the problems in life, all day it is a big one. Yeah, there may be the last six months or the year of your life very often has very little value anymore. Uh, yeah, it's a very difficult time. Uh, and if you remember that, that that is part of our life, we all have to go there. It may not seem unpleasant. You may even feel a bit repelled by the idea of being really old and not being able to look after yourself. It may be repelling, and yet it is true. Uh, that is the way things are here. So it brings back, okay, I have to find my refuge somewhere else, not the refuge in the body. And of course, the answer to that is the spiritual path. Uh. So simple things can be made profound by thinking about them in the right way here uh, and bringing it in deep inside of us uh, rather than thinking about it in a superficial way here. Uh. So that is the idea behind this. It's not just to make you depressed. Are you getting depressed? No, you're okay? Okay, good. Uh, if anyone is getting depressed, <laughs> let me know, yeah? And then we can we sort that out later on. Hello, uh, Jerry. Hey, nice to see you again. <laughs> so, um, uh, this is what this is uh, all about. Uh, now, the next one uh, we're coming to is uh, uh, illness is suffering, uh, yeah? And again, it's almost so bleeding obvious that you wonder why on earth does the Buddha say, talk about this, but again it's exactly the same thing, that what is obvious on the surface it also has a much deeper meaning. Yeah? This is very similar to old age, except that illness can happen any time through your life. Yeah? Some of you have taken, oh, not so many masks anymore that we had this morning, are you getting less afraid of the coronavirus now? <laughs> You're okay? <laughs> okay. So, uh, illness, yeah, just around the corner. They are, when people wear the mask, obviously they are afraid of illness. Either they are afraid or they don't want to spread to others. Either it's out of compassion for others uh, or it's because they don't want to have it, depending on the s- situation. Uh, but so we are afraid, yeah. You, it's, it's amazing. You read about this coronavirus in the newspapers uh, and the whole world is kind of turning upside down, yeah, and every stopping all the flights and the economy is going down and everything is kind of stopping because of this virus so small. Yeah, but so much power. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. So, uh, and sometimes people overreact. Uh, there was supposed to be, I was told yesterday, there was four people who were supposed to be on this retreat, uh, but they didn't come because of the coronavirus. Too dangerous to travel to KL, yeah, because of this. Uh, and, uh, That, I think, is very unfortunate because sometimes uh, there are certain things in life that are really worthwhile doing. uh, And if you don't do those things that are fundamental to what makes life a good life, to make you happy, if you don't do those things, uh, then even staying alive sometimes is almost pointless. Okay, you may stay alive, but then you don't do anything worthwhile. Sometimes it's better to die doing something good uh, than just... (laughs) (laughs) not do those things. You know what I mean? Sometimes you just have to do it, yeah, because you know it's it's right. It didn't it didn't even cross my mind not to travel, even though I you know from Perth, of course I was gonna travel. I was in Hong Kong in um, 
uh, November, uh, and they were wondering whether I really wanted to Hong Kong. They said other people were cancelling the Dhamma talks in Hong Kong because of the, you know, the troubles there. And I said, of course I'm going to go to Hong Kong, just because there are some demonstrations. Or so what? It's irrelevant. Actually, in times of difficulties, uh, it's a good time to teach the Dhamma. Yeah, because that is precisely when you understand the suffering and problems of life. That is when you need the solution. And I was disappointed by some of the people in Hong Kong, because some of them, they chose to kind of go around taking part in demonstrations and thinking about politics, instead of coming to my little, little retreat. And I thought, it's, what are you doing? <laughs> This is the time, instead of getting angry and upset and shouting at the op opposite, uh, this is the time to chill and try to understand the nature of life. This is politics for you, always uncertain, unreliable. It doesn't matter whether you are pro the mainland government or you are pro the Hong Kong uh, island or whatever you are. Hong Kong very split yeah, between w what they support. Uh, doesn't matter. Now is the time to think about Dhamma, because the life is so uncertain. So, coronavirus, all of these things, they are grist for the mill. So, welcome, coronavirus. <laughs> then it doesn't seem so dangerous anymore. Yeah. So, so, you remember, this is the nature of the body. Yeah? This is what will happen. Uh, nothing has really gone wrong when there is coronavirus. Everything has gone right. Uh, we can expect to have more coronaviruses in the future. Uh, we can expect these things to happen. There have been influenza pandemics apparently in the past, big ones. Uh, there was a famous one in just a, about a hundred years ago called the Spanish flu. I don't know if you heard about that. Uh, and that was uh, about 1917, so it was while there was the First World War or towards the end of the First World War. Millions of people died apparently. It's only just over a hundred years ago. Uh, and these things can happen again. Uh, this is the reality of the human body. Uh, if you get sick, uh, it is to be expected. Doctor, doctor, I'm something is right with me. I'm sick again today. Uh, that's Aja Brahm's advice. Yeah? And then the doctor thinks you have gone insane and they send you off to some kind of... Uh, <laughs> to be locked up somewhere. But, uh, so this is the reality of the physical body. So remember that. Uh, and being ill is actually very unpleasant. I tend to have very good health. Uh, usually I don't get ill, but a couple of years ago I got ill for the first time in 20 years. It wasn't very bad, it was just kind of fever. I was just kind of lying there, oh no. <laughs> and I've completely forgotten how bad it feels to be ill. It feels terrible, no energy, can't do anything. You just want, you know, there's nothing you can do except lying on this bed. And I thought, wow, the Buddha was right. Sickness is really, illness is dukkha. Yeah. Then I understood, I've completely forgotten how bad it was. I thought, yeah, illness, no, no big deal. But actually, it is very debilitating when you get ill. So uh, sometimes when you, you can go many, many years without illness, after a while you forget the reality of this, and then it hits you again. Uh, then the coronavirus comes, then the cancer comes. Uh, yeah? So much cancer in the world now. Uh, my father died of cancer just under a year ago. Uh, my sister died of cancer soon after that, uh, about five or six months ago. Uh, and uh, so sometimes I think of myself, well, if my whole family, if my family has so much cancer, where is my cancer? Huh? Yeah, but it's being like being realistic, isn't it? Huh? If your family is dying, why shouldn't you have cancer too? Huh? And it just reminds me of the reality of these things. Huh? So I start to think, oh, scary, well, there must, must be some cancer. Maybe very, very likely there is some cancer there. Maybe it hasn't really blossomed out yet, but it's there, waiting to come out. Huh? So Again, uh, the idea, the reality of life, yeah? any time you can get sick, uh, it's never wrong to get sick, it's always right, uh, because the opposite side of health is sickness. If you can be healthy, you can always get sick. Yeah? You can say that health is only two, is only a period of time between two moments of sickness. Uh, so sickness always comes back again, uh, eventually. Uh. And when you remember that, again, the idea, very similar to the previous idea, the idea that when you remember the downside, the negative side of things, uh, when you remember the reality of this, you start becoming silly just because you're healthy. Uh. When you're healthy, you think, yeah, I'm strong, I'm healthy, everything is okay. Uh. And because of that, uh, yeah, because of re not remembering the reality of life, uh, you do bad things. Uh, you are intoxicated by health, uh, forgetting the reality of life. Uh. And also, as, as with old age, it takes away some of that uh, 
interest in life, when life has so many downsides, uh, nothing has gone wrong with you and you are still sick. Doctor, doctor, something has gone wrong with me. No, nothing has gone wrong with you. This is the reality. There is no such thing as freedom from illness. There's no such thing as having a life where there is no illness. It's always part of us. It is right. And it's, uh, once you get into that frame of mind, again, it makes life feel less interesting. It guides you towards a spiritual path uh, because it reminds you that it is the mind that where freedom from illness can happen, not in the physical body. That is where you have to develop yourself. That is where you have to make, it, make a difference. So very similar to the idea of old age with a sickness. So um, think about these things in the right way. It's, it's interesting with um, someone like Ajahn Brahm. You know, he, he is the one who kind of says these things about, you know, when you go to the doctor, he says, oh, doctor, doctor, something is right with me. I'm sick again today. He says these things, but people often don't take it seriously enough because Ajahn Brahma says it with a smile as a joke, but it's true. Yeah, sometimes you have to listen carefully uh, to these uh, kind of great monks when they talk. Uh, it's like when I recently went to visit Ajahn Ganha in Thailand, I was there in December. He's one of these great monks, but he's so unassuming, yeah, he's so ordinary, like no ego, no sense of self. Uh, and when he talks, he talks so gently, so kindly, so softly. You want to give him a hug, that's what you want to do. You can't do that, you can't give, he might be Arahant, you can't go give hugs to Arahants, but that's, and he feels like this kind uncle, yeah, super duper kind. And you have to be listen very carefully. His teachings are so simple. Coming from this beautiful place inside, so simple, but so kind and so compassionate, that sometimes you don't even listen properly, but they're very beautiful teachings. Maybe if you have time, I'll tell a little bit more about what he taught me when I was here there recently. I was only there a few couple of months ago visiting this great monk, Ajahn Ganha. So listen to these teachings, simple but powerful. Now I want to move on to the next, uh, next one. In this one, and this is the contemplation of death. Yeah, all of these things are really contemplation. Death is suffering here. Yeah. And uh, this is uh, the most important one of these. Uh, yeah, because old age and illness, they kind of come together in death. Death usually has to do with old age, it has to do with illness, everything, all of these things come together in death. Uh, that's why you have everything in one go. And death is more difficult than any of these to really deal with in a proper way. Yeah. And, uh, why is it? What is it about death that is so hard? And I will do a guided death contemplation later on, on this retreat because I think that can be quite useful. Uh, you can see what you think. Uh, you, you, usually you don't die at the end, so you can just relax. It's okay. You come back again afterwards. Uh. <laughs> but uh, So the idea of death is that it is a moment of radical impermanence. Yeah, of radically being out of control, uh, the world going kind of against your wishes. Uh, it is impermanent because there are so many things you have to let go of, uh, and if you don't let go of them, you're going to suffer really, really badly at the moment of death. Uh, yeah, it is so obvious when you think about it. Uh, everything you own in this world uh, has to go. Uh, everything you own. Are you ready for that? Uh, to let go of everything in this world? Uh, Everything, the most, your most dearest possessions, the thing you have. Uh, many of you probably are because you've been doing this for a while, uh, but still it can be hard. Uh, I have been watching people in Australia, we have all these bushfires uh, yeah, all the time and people's houses are burning down. Uh, everything they own was in that house, everything is gone. Uh, it's very hard to deal with. Uh, yeah, when all your possessions, everything you own disappears like that. Uh, and people are kind of really upset and crying and you know, distraught. Uh, everything I you I spent my whole life building up this house. Uh, and now it is all gone. Uh, very, dis very distressing for people. Ma for ordinary people anyway, not if you practice a lot of Dhamma. Some of you here may be able to deal with this better. Uh, but ordinary people, very, very hard. Uh, I spoke to Ajahn Brahm, and this is one of those kind of interesting stories, and it shows some of the, it's a very simple power, but a very profound power that you get when you practice really, really well. Uh, 
At Bodhinyana Monastery in 1991, in January the 30th, 1991, uh, it was the hottest day in Western Australia up to that point. It was 46.1 degrees or something. That's really hot, yeah? Even in KL, you don't usually get 46 degrees. Uh, not only was it 46 degrees, it was, it was towards the middle of summer, towards the end of summer. So it had been dry for a very long period of time, and there were strong winds. And then there was a fire coming. Yeah, This is the worst possible fire conditions. There was a fire coming from the south, moving towards the monastery. Yeah. And then, of course, the fire brigade said to the, mo to the monks, you have to be all ready to evacuate, yeah, because this is looking really, really bad. Uh, and uh, the fire came closer. Ajahn Brahm wanted to stay in the monastery, but the fire brigade said, no, we have to evacuate. Uh, and this fire is like what they call a, it's a, it's a crown fire. It goes through the crown of the trees. Yeah? So it jumps from one tree to the next one, and the tree kind of explodes. Yeah? The wind is strong, and it carries on to the next tree. The next tree explodes. Uh, and then I saw the, p I've seen the pictures, I wasn't there at the time, uh, this was before my time. Uh, I, I only came to Bodhinyana Monastery in 1994, this was 1991. Uh, and it looked like a moon landscape, there was nothing green left in the entire monastery. All the grass, all the leaves, all the bushes, everything was burnt. Uh, it wasn't killed, so the trees kind of came back again, yeah, but it was all, all the greenery was gone. Uh, so it was very strong fire. Uh, so then they left the monastery, yeah. and then Ajahn Brahm told me that the moment they all left the monastery, yeah, he thought, uh, this is it, uh, the whole monastery is going to burn down, all the buildings, everything is going to disappear. Yeah. Now the reason why this was so powerful for Ajahn Brahm, Ajahn Brahm was, had been building up that monastery, yeah. he had spent the previous eight years, uh, yeah, or what is it, seven years or eight years, uh, just doing one thing, building up the monastery. Yeah. He came to Australia with the purpose of building up the monastery. He spent almost all his time working from seven in the morning to seven at night very often, uh, putting all of these buildings into place. Uh, sometimes Ajahn Brahm was literally the builder. Yeah, he had signed the papers himself uh, to build these buildings. Uh, working so hard, yeah. And you know what it's like when you have been working so hard for something. Uh, yeah, for year after year after year, putting in everything. Yeah. And when Ajahn Brahm works, he works with incredible meticulousness, with great care, with great mindfulness and great samadhi, because those are his character traits. Uh. Put his whole life into this, uh. and now it is about to burn down. Uh. Just one of the stories that he tells, a kind of a crazy story, uh, when he was building this, he was actually the builder. He had his name on the uh, building approval for the main hall. Many of you have been to Perth, right? Uh, yeah? Yeah? Okay, good. Okay, that's good. <laughs> so you've been to Perth, so you know the main hall at Bodhinyana Monastery, right? The main hall is like, uh, it has, you know, the, on, the, on the short walls, it has like an apex going up and then the roof coming down, yeah? So that apex coming down at the very top there is maybe eight to nine meters high. It's very, very high up there. Uh, and Ajahn Brahm, when he was, he, he was still much younger, he didn't have, his tummy was a bit smaller than it is now, <laughs> fortunately. So he, he, this would have been 1987 or thereabouts, that's just over 30 years ago. So he was already getting close to 40 years old. But, so when those apex was read, it was there was no roof yeah, at the building at this time. There were just like bricks like this going up, so it was like steps. So he it's just narrow, very narrow, and it's eight meters down on one side, eight meters down on the other side, and the, it's not, it's not steadied by anything. It's just standing there, it's kind of whoa, 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 wobbling like this. And then he had in one hand he had the bricks, in the other hand he had the bucket with mortar, and then he walked up all the way to the top like that with one <laughs> in either hand, and then he laid the bricks at the very top, because no one else dared to do this, no one else would do it, he was the only one who was crazy enough to do it. And then he laid the bricks on the top, uh, and then he walked down again. Uh. This was how committed he was to building that monastery. Uh. I, I, w I could never do it, I would have been scared out of my mind if I was to walk up that one, it's just really scary. Uh. And it kind of, it shows you the mindfulness yeah, of Ajahn Brahm. I, I don't think he would do it these days, but uh, <laughs> at that time, maybe through psychic power, but not, not through ordinary means. Uh. <laughs> So that is how much he basically risked his life for that monastery here. Yeah. So then he thought, I've sp just spent my eight years of my life building up this monastery here. Yeah. Now it is all going to burn down. Yeah. 
So most people, they cry, they are upset, it's terrible when everything they own burned down. Ajahn Brahma's reaction was, no problem. If it all burns down, I will start again tomorrow. Yeah, that is the difference. That's the difference between someone. And it's a simple difference, but it's a difference between someone who is a meditation master and a spiritual master and someone who is an ordinary person. So I asked him, how could you do that? What is the thing that enables you to think in this way? Because most people would be devastated if their life's work is kind of suddenly all burnt up. How is it possible? And he told me the reason it's possible, he said, is because when I built that monastery, I never did it to get a result. I never did it because I wanted to have a monastery. I did it because it's a good karma, because it's a good thing to do. Yeah. So at the end of the building project, when everything was ready, I hadn't lost anything because I had already ma made that good karma. I had already put my life into doing something good. So the fact that it all burnt down was kind of irrelevant, because I did it only for good reasons. I did it out of kindness. I did it out of the goodness of my heart, to help other people, to do what is right. The result wasn't the point, it was the process that was the point. And if you do the process in the right way, you ha can never lose out, you can never lose anything. It's powerful, isn't it? It's so powerful, and it says something about the attitude that we should have to life in general, to all the things we do. The process is what matters, not the result, because the result is always going to be uncertain. The result is always going to be death. That's what, where we're heading. Yeah. So we have to make sure the process on the way there is the right one, and then we will be okay. Yeah. So this is uh, how to think about this. Yeah, and I must admit, when Ajahn Brahm said, I thought, wow, that is really profound, and it's really beautiful, and it's very rare to kind of hear people reacting in this way in the world. It shows something very amazing going on there, some kind of spirit, so this is, these are the real spiritual powers, yeah, the real spiritual powers is not flying through the air or reading minds or whatever, that's kind of irrelevant, these are the real spiritual powers because they reduce your suffering and make you, make your life worthwhile. Huh? So, uh, <coughs> that is, uh, so this is then how we can deal with death, yeah? All the external things in the world, they will have to go up in flames anyway. So why hold on to these things? Uh, instead, we ensure that we put emphasis on the process rather than the results. Uh, so we have to lose everything in our life, all the external things, all the things that we own. Yeah, this is just an, one example of that. Uh, I almost lost, tra lost track there where I was going, because <laughs> <laughs> such a detour, and then, uh, of course, we have to let go of all our personal relationships, uh, yeah, all our friends, all our acquaintances, uh, all your friends here at the BGF, uh, yeah, all, <laughs> all your, whoever it is in this world, even all your family members, uh, yeah, the people who are dearest to us, uh, they're all going to have to go. Uh, are you ready for that? That's one of the things you want to find out. Are you able to let go of all of those things? Uh, it is not so easy. Huh? I was interesting because I just mentioned to you before that my father died ten months ago, my sister about six months ago, and it was an interesting period for me because I, I always thought I'm not going to be so affected by my family members dying. Yeah, I, I was very close to my father especially, and, uh, and uh, etc. So it, it was interesting to see what would happen. Huh? And uh, and actually it was okay. It wasn't such a big deal because I had learned to think about these things in the right way. Yeah, and that is very, very helpful. Uh, there's also the fact, one of the interesting things about being a monk is that one of the, you have kind of withdrawn a little bit from the ordinary world. Uh, and I realized that one of the things that make us attached to other people uh, is the fact that we are around them all the time. Yeah, when you are around somebody all the time, they become a part of your life. Uh, almost a part of who you are, it's almost that you know you can't live without them, can't live with them, can't live without them, you know that old saying. And uh, uh, so they become such a part of you uh, that you cannot really separate anymore. Uh. So the fact that we are around people all the time actually creates attachments, attachments that have to do with habit. Uh. So this is one of the advantages, I don't know if you, if you see it that way, but that's actually one of the advantages of being a, a monk. Yeah? You kind of withdraw a little bit from that world. Uh, the world has less power over you, uh, because you don't have that close connection with people. Uh. 
when you have a like, close, really close connection, it's almost as if other people become part of you. Huh? And this is why the death of other people is so difficult. Huh? Yeah, if you have a husband or wife or sp a partner in life or children or whatever it is, and they are very close to you, it's almost as if they're part of your mind. If they are not there, it's as if something is missing. Yeah? Yeah, and this is the problem. It's, when someone dies, it's as if something in you has died because they were so close to you. And because of that hole, that emptiness, that missing part inside of you, that is why it is so difficult. So when you cry when somebody dies, well, you're crying for yourself, really. Isn't that true? We cry for ourselves because the other person, they're dead anyway. You can't, doesn't, can't really cry for them. Yeah? And maybe they, probably they were good people anyway. They're probably much happier where they are now. <laughs> Maybe, who knows, it's possible. So we usually we cry for ourselves because we are the ones who kind of are missing something. Yeah? And this is the problem. And once you think about it that way, oh, I'm crying for myself, wait a minute, uh, do I really need to do that? It changes your attitude a little bit, yeah? Uh, you can look at things differently when you realize that. Uh. So, um, are you ready to deal with people dying here? Uh? Yeah, are you able to deal with that? And when you start to think about things in that way, yeah, again, you realize you're going to have to find your happiness somewhere else. Uh, uh, yes, you can, you know, you deal with your family in this life in a good way. You are kind to them. You are caring. You do the right things. Uh, but in the end, you realize your real inner strength and happiness, your independence, has to come from something else. If it doesn't, you're going to suffer when you die. And it happens so fast. Uh, so are you ready for that? Uh, yeah, then you have your, uh, so much of your identity, uh, yeah, who you are as a person, uh, is tied up with this world, has to do with this life. Uh, you know, what is your identity? I'm going to talk about identity tomorrow in, the, in this public talk because it's something I've been thinking about recently. But um, what is that identity that you have? Well, gender is one identity, nationality, ethnic, background, uh, social status, uh, age, uh, yeah, education level, uh, yeah, your position in the family, uh, yeah, wh wh whoever you are in a family, all of these things and many more things as well uh, make us into who we are as people. They give us a sense of identity. But that identity is tied up with this world. Yeah? It is this world like, which gives that identity. Once you die, you're going to have to let go of all of that identity. You cannot take it with you. And this is one of the great things about practicing meditation. Because in meditation, one of the things we are doing is actually giving up identity. For those of you who have done a bit of meditation and who have achieved some states of peace, when you become really peaceful and you're not thinking about anything, how much identity do you have? Not much. Right? Uh, if, you are really, if you close your eyes and your body is kind of fading away and your thinking mind is fading away, you just feel beautiful and peaceful, maybe you have a sense of joy inside of you. Uh, at that point there isn't much identity anymore. You don't really have a gender, you can't really talk about yourself as male or female, it doesn't matter. You're certainly not rich and poor, it's completely irrelevant. Uh, you don't have any education in there, yeah. Actually, you have the opposite. It's like you become uneducated because your mind is empty. Yeah, you throw out that PhD or whatever. All of that kind of goes out of your, of your mind. Uh, you don't have any. You don't belong to any nationality or ethnic background. Or all of that. That's kind of irrelevant. Uh, there's almost nothing left inside. Uh, and yet, you understand that that nothing is much better than all the all the identity we have, all that identity just causes problems. It causes us to think. It makes us have to justify who we are. If someone says, says something about you which is kind of bad, yeah, and then you, that, you know, yeah, it's, someone says to you, yeah, you are stupid, but your identity is, yeah, I'm really intelligent, it causes you suffering. It causes you suffering because of your identity. Or if you feel that maybe maybe you feel that as a woman you are discriminated against, yeah, it's so difficult to become a nun. These, these men have so much better time; they can become monks more easily. Yeah, or it's really unfair. So if you identify too much with gender, it's going to hurt you. Whatever you identify with, uh, you're opening yourself up to problems and to to um, being hurt in whatever way. Uh. But that inner peaceful mind, you get rid of all of that. Uh. Not, nothing is really there anymore. Your sense of identity, what 
that makes you who you are as a person is gone. And it's so nice. It's so peaceful. Such a happy state of being. You understand, identity is a pain in the backside. <laughs> yeah, it is something that you have to have sometimes because the, you know, identity is kind of part of what it is to be alive. But it's not something that you rejoice in. People often say we should take pride in our identity. I say, just check it all out. Much better. Then you feel peaceful. You're much less vulnerable. You have an inner strength which otherwise you would never have. So how deep you go in meditation, the deeper you go in meditation, the more you are, will be able to enjoy the process of dying rather than suffer through the process of dying. Because you know that when you go deep in meditation that you have the ability to let go. And that ability to let go you have in meditation is the same ability to let go that you need when you die. It's exactly the same thing. So in a sense you are preparing yourself for dying as well. And then dying can become very, very pleasant when you do it in the right way. It can be a happy time. Isn't that wonderful to make dying a happy time? Everyone kind of thinks it is such so much suffering, but you, please, go against the stream. Make it happy instead. <laughs> Yeah, this is what I, th these are the things I always learn from Ajahn Brahm, this kind of crazy, turn the world upside down. Uh, you know, that's, that's kind of, is one of the requirements of practicing the spiritual path, uh, that we turn things upside down a bit. Uh, enjoy death rather than grieve at death. Uh. And of course the last thing we have to give up is the physical body. Yeah? And again, giving up the physical body, well, usually it's quite easy towards the end of your life because the physical body has kind of, it's pretty deteriorated anyway, so okay. Good riddance, physical body, go away, away with you. And then you kind of, whatever happens, you float up or you float out and you feel light and you feel happy. Yay! Get rid of my physical body. Hooray! Now, much better this way. We're going to cremate it. Yes, please, get rid of that physical body here. And then uh, <laughs> you are thinking in the right way here. So, uh, death is nowhere near as bad as it is made out to be especially if you are prepared, yeah, you are ready, you have kind of readied your mind, you are able to let go, you have learned that through living a long life, actually it is not bad at all, it's kind of, even can be quite nice if you're ready. So uh, this is what, uh, how the Buddha talks about this, and um, the idea here is very much like with old age and illness, if you think about death in the right way, you tend to become peaceful. You tend to be remember what is important in life. You get your priorities right. Uh, you don't allow yourself to be intoxicated with life. You don't allow yourself to do stupid things because, yay, I'm living now, I can do many things. Death is, oh, death is kind of far away. It's not never that far away. Uh, actually, much better to think that death is around the corner than to think that it is far away. Uh, because then you become much more wiser about things uh, if you think like that. Uh. So how can we think that death is around the corner? Do you f feel like death is around the corner, any one of you? Does it feel like, doesn't feel that way, right? Uh, let's be honest, it always feels like it's somewhere in the distance. Uh, yeah? And this is part of the problem. Uh, it doesn't feel, I don't feel like I'm going to die on my next breath. Uh, am I? It <laughs> doesn't feel like it. Uh, yeah? so, and, uh, but w one day we shall die. Uh, we know that much. Unless you are ready now, you will not be ready when it eventually happens. Now is the only time you can be ready here. So now we shall be ready. So how can you do that? Uh, and that is to remember, well, how is it that people die anyway? You are going to die just like everyone else. Uh, so when you open up a newspaper and you see someone has died, uh, don't think, oh, that's someone else. Think, that could be me. That is the right way to think. There was an investigation done in the South African University a while ago. I read about this. Uh, this was a um, research project and how people react when they read in a newspaper that someone has died. Yeah, every day you can read in a paper someone has died, or maybe people do. St people still read papers. In the, yeah, still read papers. Okay, I, I don't know what people do these days. I'm kind of old-fashioned because I entered the monastery before the age of the internet, so I'm completely out of it now. I'm like a dinosaur when it comes to these things. Uh, it's quite nice to be dinosaur, actually. Uh, um, but I'm the kind kind of dinosaur, not the bad one, not the Tyrannosaurus or anything like that. Uh, I'm the good-hearted dinosaur. But <laughs> so, uh, 
uh, you read about, and at this research they did at the South African University, they got people to read about other people's death, and then they measured how they react to that, yeah? And what they found is that almost everybody here, when they read about someone's death, it's like, oh yeah, that's someone else, that's someone else, yeah? Got nothing to do with me, Not nothing, this is kind of completely irrelevant for me that someone else has died here. Yeah, and so in other words, when we read that, we don't really know how to deal with it. Uh, we're not able to understand that, well, one day we are going to be exactly the same. We are going to die of the same kind of things that other people die of, because that's what people die of. Uh, instead, we make it other, we make it different. We don't want to deal with it. Uh, so when you read in the paper, instead of thinking like that, think, that could be me. I may die in the same way. Traffic accident, uh, yeah, stumbling over something. Uh, Getting the coronavirus, that's pretty, that's very real now, isn't it? Uh, yeah, very, very, you know, probably, we don't know what's going to happen, but, you know, a lot of people are getting this coronavirus. Uh, so illnesses, uh, all of these things can happen at any time. Uh, and uh, before you, you know it, uh, you might actually be dead. It can happen so fast. Uh. So the Buddha asked us to imagine, yeah, if that we could actually die at any time, uh, and imagine the causes for death to make it more real. When you open the newspaper, it could be you. Uh, and then, uh, when you do that, uh, you bring it into the present moment. Uh, and the Buddha says, ideally, and this is a very high bar to clear, and I, you know, I don't expect anyone here to be able to do this, but the Buddha says, ideally, we should be able to be prepared to die on the next breath. That's the ideal. Very hard, yeah, very hard to be ready for that. Uh, so you gradually you take it closer to the present moment, uh, and maybe one day you will be able to do that, uh, but that's quite difficult to do. Huh? So uh, this is the idea, and when you do this, uh, yeah, when you remind yourself that you could die at any time, uh, you understand that you might be meeting these people for the last time. This is the last time I might see Bobby. I can see him sitting there. Maybe it's the last time I see you, Bobby. Huh? What happens then? Do I want to say something nasty to you the last time I see you? No. If it's the last time you see somebody, you want to say goodbye in a friendly and kind way. Yeah. You want to be kind to people if it's the last time. You don't want to see, oh, but, okay, now I'm going to die. No, you don't want to be like that. So it changes your attitude. If you know you could die at any time, it makes you a more kind person, more caring. Because this is what death does to us uh, when it is the last time we might, might see each other. Huh? And so the idea of death, uh, if you do it, use it in the right way, makes you a better person, more kind, more caring, more supporting of others, uh, more saying the nice things, the good things at the right time. Uh, that's what it does to you. Huh? So this is, in this way, death, if you use it wisely, uh, it's actually incredibly Supportive, supportive for your spiritual practice, supportive for all of these things that we want to do on the spiritual path. Instead of being something depressive, it becomes something uplifting because it makes you a better person. So this is how to think about this in the right way. Yeah, and this, so, and if you do this, then life starts to become incredibly meaningful and useful because uh, you're turning things upside down. Uh, you're using death for a beautiful purpose uh, to make yourself a better person. Uh, I remember there was, a, I usually say this at the, this kind of time, but it's a very nice little thing to, to say. There was a man I met many years ago. He was a Sri Lankan originally, but he was then a, he was, he was an Australian citizen by then. Uh, but he told me that every time he leaves his house in the morning, uh, he reminds himself, I could die today. Uh, and because I could die today, I have to leave my wife and my children in a good way. Uh, can't really have an argument. I want to say something kind to them when I, when I leave. Uh, and this way, he used the idea of death yeah, in a very positive way. Uh, but really, we should take that into all our relationships. Uh, everything could be the last time. Uh, and then uh, we can die with a peaceful heart, at ease, because we have treated the world in a good way. So this is one way of using the death contemplation. Yeah? The second way, you can use it in your meditation practice. If you can die at any time, 
If you can step into the street and some crazy driver kills you, or, or you step into the street and somebody breathes coronavirus into your face, uh, or whatever, <laughs> whatever it is, uh, yeah? if you can die at any time, then you don't really have so much ill will and desires for this world anymore. Uh, because the desires relating to this world only make sense if you have a future. If you have no future, uh, what's the point of having lots of desires? Uh, what's the point of thinking about that new BMW you're going to have, uh, or that new relationship you're going to have, or that new house you're going to have, or whatever it is, uh, all of that is out the window. Uh, almost all desires, even your next meal, doesn't matter if you are about to die. Uh, so almost all desires go out of the window. So thinking about death in the right way, it makes you peaceful. Uh, and this is why death contemplation can be very useful as part of your meditation practice. Uh, yeah, you bring the reality of death into your mind, uh, saying to yourself, I have no future. Because really, ultimately you don't. Ultimately all of this has, has to go anyway, so really you don't have a future in this world. Uh, I have no future, so why am I having desires? Uh, why am I thinking about all of this? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, let it all go. It's all going to have to go anyway. If you have no future, why think about the future? <laughs> Why think about a mirage? Why, why, why think about an imagination, something which doesn't really exist? Uh, I have no future. <laughs> usually if, if people say, oh, you have no future, it's a, it's a put down, yeah? But here you're taking it on board to yourself. Yeah, I have no future. And then you become peaceful, you become calm, because nothing, none of these silly little things uh, that are important to us in this world matter anymore. Let it all go. Then you go to the breath. The breath is so peaceful, huh? it is so beautiful. Why? Because you had let the whole world go. Huh? So, yeah, you overcome your defilements of the mind by contemplating death. Huh? But the final thing, the most important thing for me, again, is this big picture thing. Huh? If we're going to have to, if we're going to have to die, huh? if we're going to have to let go of everything in our life, if that is true, huh? yeah, you don't want to come into the end of your life and you're still holding on, grasping on to these things. No, I don't want to die. Don't want to die. It's not going to help you that you don't want to die. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's pointless. Yeah, you're going to die anyway. And don't want to die. If that is your attitude, it's going to be a very difficult period for you. Huh? It's going to be very hard. And this is why you see some people, they die well, they let go and peacefully, whilst others struggle towards the very end. And the reason why they struggle is because they can't let go. Huh? And it's painful to watch when someone dies like that. Uh, it's like they're being pulled from this world uh, without really wanting to be pulled from this world. Uh, yeah? They can't. They, they don't want to. But they have to. They have no choice. Uh. So when you see that, when you realize that, you start to think about life in a different way. And this is why this is right view. This is why this is so incredibly important. And what you start to think about is that, well, when I pass away from here, I want to have not spent my whole time building up things that I then have to let go of anyway. What's the point of building up all of this stuff and then get attached to it and then having to let it go? I'm just creating suffering for myself. What can I do so that I build up things I can take with me? What is it that you can take with you when you die? What you can take with you when you die is your quality of your heart. Yeah, it is your beautiful mind that you have built up. That is the only thing that goes with us. And another name for that is Kamma. Yeah, Kamma is really all the good personal qualities that you have. So that is what you build up. And then, when you die, because you have a lot of good inner qualities, uh, you bring those with you into the future, uh, yeah? There's much less worry, much less concern, much less easier to give up all the worldly things of this life uh, that don't matter so much. Uh. So what you do, you start to think about life in a new way. Uh. You start to invest in your mind, you create a pure and beautiful heart inside of you, a mind that doesn't have all of these too many defilements, uh, that is what you spend your life doing. Uh. How do you do that? Uh. How you do that is you don't have to make a radical change. Uh. You don't have to become a monk or a nun straight away. You can wait five minutes. No. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to even to become a monk or a nun. What, it, what the only difference really between someone who lives well and someone who lives not well is not what they do. It is the attitude they have to what they do. Huh? So if you are a person who, if you do your things in life, yeah, whatever it is, your job, 
your fam being a family member, whatever it is that you do in life, if you do it with a good heart, uh, if you do it with kindness, uh, if you do it to serve and to be generous and a good person towards others, if you have that attitude, then everything in life becomes an act of a good karma. Everything in life becomes something that moves you to a more beautiful and pure heart. Uh, and then when you die and look back on your life, you think, wow, I've lived a really good life. Uh, you feel really good about yourself, yeah? And then you take that beautiful mind with you into the future. Every m waking moment of our life, uh, we have the opportunity to make good karma. You can treat people with kindness, or you can treat people uh, badly here. Yeah? You can think kind thoughts, or you can think fault-finding and negative uh, f uh, thoughts. Uh, it's up to you. Huh? You can guide yourself, change yourself in a new way, to become a new person. Uh, it's all about attitude. It's how we live, not what we do, that matters. Uh, and everything can be turned around in that way. Then you are living to a real purpose. Then you are using the death contemplation in an incredibly productive way. Uh, yeah, it guides you towards that. Uh. It was so interesting because when I, my sister died, I was in the middle of the rains retreat. Yeah? I had to go back to Norway in the middle of the rains retreat. And very fascinating because I conducted the funeral service. Yeah? It's very interesting. It's very nice actually to conduct funeral service for your relatives. Because uh, a wonderful way of saying the final goodbye. It's a Buddhist monk. Yeah? It's one of the good things about being a Buddhist monk, I did the funeral service for my father. I also did the funeral service for my sister uh, afterwards. Uh. That's a big, big benefit, right? Is that right? Uh, so do you <laughs> Actually, I think it is. Personally, I think it is a really big benefit for, ma for many reasons. It's a wonderful way of saying a final goodbye to your, your most dearest people. Uh, uh, and it's very hard. If you are very emotionally involved, it's very hard to lead and conduct the whole funeral service. But if you have the ability to stand back a little bit, uh, it's a very beautiful thing. Yeah. So it's a beautiful thing to do. And then I, of course, the audience was there. V m both my father and sister were very popular people, so very large number of people, 300 people or whatever coming to these funerals. Yeah, lot and lot of people. Huh? And most of those people didn't know anything about Buddhism. In, in no way, people aren't religious. Yeah, nobody believes in any religion. It's, it's all about BMWs and big houses in no way. Huh? That's all they care about. <laughs> Very materialistic. Actually, the whole world is getting very materialistic, but Norway is no, no exception. Huh? And uh, so I get there, yeah, th th then everyone knows that my father had a son who was a Buddhist monk, yeah? because this is the kind of thing that spreads like wildfire, yeah? Buddhist monks are wow, you know, everyone, because people are really curious about that. So that's kind of one of the nice things, because when people are curious, you're already they're kind of lending one ear almost, yeah? So the first thing that was so interesting about that, that funeral service is often a very good time to talk about Dhamma, because people are ready to listen to spiritual things at funerals, yeah? Everyone becomes a bit somber and quiet. Uh, and that's why we don't usually tell too many jokes at funerals, except, except for Ajahn Brahm, he, does, he tells the occasional <laughs> joke. He tells jokes everywhere, including at funerals. Uh. But very interesting, because I just gave a very kind of ordinary talk. With I didn't use, I didn't say anything Buddhist, yeah? I didn't say kind of Buddhism is the best or anything like that. I just said Buddhist things without mentioning Buddhism. And people were like, wow, this is amazing, yeah? This is, these are people who have no religion, they have no spiritual life, they have nothing. And yet they found it so meaningful and so powerful to listen to these Buddhist teachings. And later on I was invited privately to give talks to people. It was just um, astonishing the kind of feedback you got. Uh, and uh, the same thing when my sister's funeral later on. And it reminded me that these teachings of the Buddha are very, very powerful. If you hear these things, even if you have no clue about any kind of religion, it's like, whoa, is this what Buddhism is about? Jeepers, I better become a Buddhist. Well, they didn't say that, but I almost got that feeling. Yeah. <laughs> So that's what happened at that, this funeral ceremony. It was, very, it was a very interesting experience because it shows me how open the world is to these teachings uh, because they are very powerful, they're so practical, they really relate directly to our lives. So. But what was also interesting, and this is really what I wanted to talk about, was that uh, when my sister died, it was kind of, it was very strong for me because she was wasn't that old. Yeah, she was 52 when she died. She's a couple of years younger than me. 
and um, uh, she was she's one of these very energetic people yeah super lots of energy running around doing things all the time she's like this unstoppable force my sister she was like that she probably still is wherever she is now but she's like this unstoppable force uh, and uh, she was always doing things yeah she couldn't i don't th I think she was very restless she couldn't sit still for five minutes uh, except towards the end because she was getting so ill the cancer was getting so strong yeah? And she built up, she worked so hard. She had two children, uh, and they, when she died, they were 17 and 19, so they weren't very young anymore, so they seemed to be able to deal with it reasonably well. Uh, and then she worked so hard, she built up, a f she had a farm, yeah? She, w she wasn't a farmer originally, but she still, she got herself a farm and built up this farm, this enormous farmhouse, and she kind of put in <laughs> immense energy trying to build this up. Uh, and in the middle of doing all of these things, uh, it all had to go. It wasn't even finished yet, yeah, when she died. All of that work, and then those children growing up as well, all of that work, all that investment into the children, into the farm, into all of these things, and then you have to die. For what? And then it gets passed on to someone else. It gets sold out of the family and gets sold to some other people who are going to take over the farm. And it seemed to me so empty when I saw that. It seemed so purposeless. Uh, I wanted to tell her, what are you doing? Uh, what, is, what are you running after? What are you trying to create? Uh, and now you're going to die. Uh, this is it. Uh, but then of course it was too late. Uh, but it reminded me of how important it is that it's not what we do. She was probably too materialistic. She had to come to the very end of her life because she's before she started becoming interested in spiritual things. Uh, and she actually asked to have me as her funeral director or whatever you want to call it. That was very nice. I really appreciate that. Uh, but I wasn't really able to turn her around before that. Uh, it took her a long time to come around. Uh, the rest of my family, they all more or less became Buddhist. Uh, yeah, because they kind of... But my sister, she was a really hard case. <laughs> so she had to come face to face with death before she really understood uh, what is going on. Uh, and I thought, whoa, all of this, yeah, all of these things that you've been doing. Wow, you had so much energy here. I wish you had put a little bit more thought into the spiritual life uh, instead of all of these things, which now it all has to go. Uh, and I got this feeling of uh, kind of, oh, so empty here, uh, yeah, so pointless. Uh, it was, that was the most powerful thing I got out of seeing my, my sister when she passed away like that. Uh. So make sure you don't fall into the same trap. Uh, Make sure that when you live your life, when you come to the end, you have lived well, you have lived with meaning, you have put a good heart into your life. It is how you live that matters. And death, if you use death in the right way, it will remind you again and again and again. It is how you live, putting in good qualities, putting in a good heart in everything, in every word you say, in every act you do, in every thought you think. And if you can do that, Wow, you will have lived a life which is so meaningful. Uh, and then when you eventually die, you will die in a good way and you will carry on into a good future afterwards. Uh. Okay, let's take a break. See you back again at 2.45.